there's something that I'm going to mention before you ask any questions that you don't even know about this. This is a very special day, not just because we're having this interview, because this happens to be my birthday. <laughs> I'm 75 years old today. <laughs> and I came when I was 28. Uh, so this is my 47th year at the, at the law school. Yeah, so it's just coincidence that we happened to pick this day. Well, so th that segues, I think, rather naturally into your coming here yeah. in 1968. Um, it was 69. Now, it was spring of 69. Spring of 69. Spring of 69, I came. Yeah. You, you didn't follow a path that many people had followed. That is to That's say, right. a graduate of Tulane, New Orleans, right? raised, um, and yet you came to New York. Yes. Can you tell us how did that come about? How, how that happened? Yeah, that's very it's very interesting, uh, especially uh, as a New Orleanian because uh, New Orleanians are never supposed to leave New Orleans at least during that time and I, I assumed at the time that I was growing up and getting my education that I'd live my life in New Orleans. Uh, but I also wanted to I always was interested in things international and cross-cultural so I wanted to spend uh, time abroad which I did and uh, I also wanted to study at the highest levels of uh, academic work in the country to see how uh, those standards, what those standards really were. So I did a uh, JSD, SJD it was called then, at Harvard Law School. And then I was in the market for a teaching position. Tulane, my alma mater at the basic undergraduate level and also where I did my basic law degree, offered me a position, uh, but I thought, you know, it'd be better to consider uh, going somewhere else, maybe return there at some point. Uh, so I just went on the market uh, for a, a job. And uh, I put in my uh, information that I was interested in, of course, international law. That was what always uh, drove me uh, in the field of, of law. As a law student, I was interested in law teaching. Uh, always. Uh, that, that just struck me. I loved law school, loved the whole concept of, and the whole process of thinking about law, legal questions, debating it, and trying to improve upon principles, and uh, especially in the international and cross-cultural field, that always excited me, and I was uh, fascinated by it, and that's why I wanted to go abroad, and I did. But then when I was looking for a position, I put on the uh, sheet uh, for background and what you were looking for, I wanted to uh, particularly would be interested in a port city. And I wind up at Ithaca. <laughs> well, uh, when I was uh, interviewing uh, for the position, people pointed out to me that admiralty law applies on Lake Cayuga because you can navigate from Lake Cayuga to the Great Lakes, to the Erie Canal, to the Hudson, out to the large world. So. It wasn't exactly the port city I had in mind, but uh, it was actually a case where admiralty law applied. And that was partly what was in my mind in putting down port city. I figured port city is going to have some admiralty practice. Then admiralty was more of a factor in legal curricula than it is today. And even as a practice field, uh, it was a specialty in practice. Now it's been incorporated in the larger law firms, the, the branches of admiralty and not so many firms that are just admiralty. But I was thinking admiralty and I was thinking international trade, which is what I did at Harvard. And I was always interested in comparative law. So I thought a port city would be an appropriate uh, uh, starting point. So how did I wind up at, at Cornell, despite the admiralty jurisdiction, which applies on Lake Cayuga? Well, a number of factors. Uh, Ray Forrester was the dean at Cornell at that time. Yeah. Ray had just come from Tulane. Uh, I, he was not the dean at Tulane when I was a student at Tulane, but he knew all the faculty at Tulane. Just as I started at Tulane, he had come to Cornell to be the dean at Cornell. And the faculty at, at Tulane were very supportive of me, and that clearly caught Ray's attention. So when I was in the market, that was a boost for me, uh, for, for Cornell to be interested. And then I was in international law, and I wanted a career in international law. That was clearly what I wanted. And at that point, Cornell was quite interested in expanding its international uh, faculty and its international program. 
Cornell as a university had received a number of grants from the Ford Foundation to support international studies. The Center for International Studies, as it was called then, now it's called the Ayanaudi uh, Center for International Studies, was operating, uh, partly because of a Ford Foundation grant, and the law school got a, a piece of those grants to develop international law. Uh, and the people on the faculty at that time were Rudy Schlesinger, the ones who were core international people were Rudy Schlesinger and Bob Anthony. There were other faculty members who did comparative types of things, but they were the two core members. And they wanted to expand. And at the time, I was told that the average age of the Cornell Law faculty was 55. I was 28. And they wanted to bring that average down a little bit. <laughs> so they wanted some younger people. Plus, uh, Rudy was going towards the mandatory retirement age at that time, 65. Uh, so again, they wanted someone younger to maintain and expand the international program. So they were interested in me for that reason. So the, the factors that were crucial were uh, that Cornell was at that point looking for a young person, an entry level uh, teacher, uh, someone in the international field, uh, and uh, uh, Ray was the dean and was uh, uh, speaking to people at Tulane who knew me and who were big supporters. And also I had a lot of support from Harvard too. And my Harvard uh, professors were telling me, if you can go to Cornell, go to Cornell because that's the top flight school. So I was really very, very fortunate to have a chance to start at the top, as people would say, uh, instead of having to start at the bottom and work your way up to the top. You spoke of the average age of the yeah. Cornell faculty at the time you joined it. That also meant that the kind of hiring that you represent, entry level hiring, was a novelty. Entirely a novelty and when they uh, when I was hired. You were uh, say quite alone in your cohort. Yeah. Um, was that a challenge? Or, you know, well I'll tell you the biggest challenge, Peter, was as you say, this was not common for, for the law school. The law school was very used to lateral hiring, and that's how it had built its faculty up until about that time. And I think I was probably the first sort of entry-level person who didn't have even any practice experience because I had just gone through the route of doing the uh, SJD, uh, studied abroad in Germany, and then went to Harvard and did the SJD there, and, and then came right into teaching. So I was really young. and, and wet behind the ears, so uh, I was uh, very unusual for Cornell, and Cornell at that time didn't have a tradition of uh, entry-level people and didn't particularly know exactly how to help entry-level people get their feet on the ground and develop, and I... So if I can insert, and yeah. basically, roughly at the time I entered law teaching, uh -huh. in fact, I spoke with a Cornell Law School representative at the annual association meeting where there was a lot of exchange with potential employers of beginning teachers. Yeah. And I was told quite directly by the Cornell faculty person that Cornell didn't hire any people. Right. I should go get my experience somewhere else. That was the pattern. That was the pattern. So I think I was one of the, if the, not the first person to break that pattern. Of course, now it's become very much of a pattern uh, for us in all law schools. But here's the point I wanted to make about what that experience was like. Because Cornell didn't have any prior experience, as I said, they weren't exactly familiar with how you should treat a entry-level person who has not got any experience teaching anything. And at that time, we had four courses as the teaching load. So we taught two in the fall and two in the spring. In my first three years of teaching at Cornell, I taught nine different courses. So I didn't get to teach the same course over and over. We kept switching that I would teach something else because I would fill in to pe for people who were on sabbatic. For example, Rudy, who was the star of the faculty, was on sabbatic in my first year of teaching. So I, a first year teacher, never having taught before in the spring, had to teach conflict of laws to students who were used to having that course from Rudy. Now, that was a huge challenge right? because I knew I was following up on the star teacher of the faculty at the time. Uh, I did. I worked uh, very, very hard in those years, and then there was always a, a new course, and, and so on. I always had in my teaching 
uh, complement uh, international economic law subjects. International trade, WTO, was always one of my subjects. European Union law was always something I was working in and interested in. And uh, international transactions law was something I was always interested in. I got it. Uh, admirably, I did, but not at the very beginning. I did to start teaching it in, I think, the third year. David Curtis had been teaching Admiralty, and I remember David in his grand, lovely style coming to my office and saying he had a proposition for me, which is that I could take over the Admiralty course if I wanted, and I jumped at that. I was very happy at that chance, and I taught Admiralty for a while. But I, look, I wrote down a list of all the courses I've taught at Cornell over my now going into the 47th year, and it comes out to 15 different courses. Nine in the first three years, but 15 over the years because you know, I would be teaching, I taught conflicts for a good while. Uh, and then uh, Gary Simpson joined the faculty, and that was his primary area of interest. So I said, okay, I'll let him take that and I'll teach something else. So a number of things worked that way. I did administrative law for a while, and, and then Cynthia came in, and that was her primary interest. So I said, okay, she can do that. And I moved into something else. Uh, but I held on to the things that were really closest to my intellectual interests in the area that I was publishing in, which was trade law, uh, European Union law, transactions law, international transactions law. And then in the early 90s, I added uh, international commercial arbitration, which is one of my major areas of interest currently, in fact. Uh, and there's a somewhat interesting story to how that came about. But that was my uh, beginning teaching experience uh, at Cornell, uh, very demanding. I was moved, as I remember now, uh, my first office, I've been in a bunch of places in the school, was in the arcade between Hughes Hall and the law school, and there were three of us there, Ian McNeil, Bob Summers, and me. Ian McNeil and Bob Summers were star teachers, and then here I was, the beginning teacher. As I say, Rudy, too, was a star teacher, as we all know. Uh, and we called ourselves the Center of Excellence because we were out and apart from the main building. We felt a little bit excluded, so we thought maybe we'd boost our ego by being the Center of Excellence. So I now call the third floor, which you, uh, uh, you're on the... You're on the third floor, exactly, uh, are on two. I call it the floor of excellence, Peter, so you and I are on the floor of excellence now. Uh, you shared the center of excellence with uh, two very experienced teachers, um, two very dedicated and uh, strong teachers, I guess I would say, in terms of their the discipline of their classrooms. Um, were they mentors for you, or who were folks who reached out to the students who were being asked to teach so many different things. Yeah, they, they were both uh, very helpful, very uh, supportive. Uh, uh, in the area of my writing, Bob Summers was the most, most valuable, most important. He, he made a number of very valuable suggestions to me about how I should uh, do some work. I had uh, done some pieces and let him read them, and he made a number of suggestions on how I could improve that, and I went over it again and again and rewrote, and I learned a lot from from that. Uh, Ian was just a very wonderful, supportive person in every way. Uh, his field was contracts. He also did uh, some international things uh, uh, in East yeah, African he, law. I mean, he, he taught in East Africa. In East Africa, and he wrote a book on East African law, exactly. So he, he, And then later in his career, after he had left Cornell, he was in international arbitration, in fact. Uh, I always felt close to Ian and uh, kept in touch with him uh, pretty much throughout my career. Some of his uh, his youngest son uh, used to babysit for our kids, uh, so uh, uh, that was also another one of the links. Uh, and then, of course, it was Rudy who was, the, as I say, the star teacher and really the key figure in the uh, international program, which was why it was... Uh, very successful in those early years. And then Bob Anthony and I worked very closely together because Bob was the director of the international program. Uh, and I was the new person, the assistant professor who was joining the program, trying to help it expand. So uh, we worked very frequently in trying to raise money for the program and in, in sponsoring speaker events and uh, trying to plan where the international program should go. So. Uh, Bob Anthea, Anthony and I worked very closely together in those early years. And then Bob began 
uh, taking leaves to go to the administrative conference. He was chair of the administrative conference for a period. When he was gone, I took over as acting director of the uh, international program. So not only was I teaching nine different subjects, I was also doing this administrative work as uh, acting director of the international program. And then, and then he left. And then he left, and I became the director in 1974. I was director from 1974 to 1988. For a couple of years, Fred Amon was the director. And then I began the director again in 1990 until 1994 when uh, I stepped down and now Muna Andulo is the Reich director of the Berger International Legal Studies Program. 2014. That's right. Yeah, approximately. That's right. Yeah, I don't think anybody else is in any program at Cornell has been a director that long. That wasn't the normal pattern. The normal pattern was you were directed for a director for a certain number of years, and then somebody else replaced you. But in those early years, there was nobody else, uh, and that was sort of my role to keep the international program going. Over that span of time, I'm sure a tremendous amount of change. That's right. It's tremendously gratifying, but it always seemed to me to be an inevitable development for uh, legal education in general and Cornell Law School in particular and the university. The university's always had an international uh, dimension to it and a vision in the international area, and the law school did too. You'll go back to Myron Taylor, right, at least. And I'm sure it goes back beyond uh, Myron Taylor's time, but uh, he gave the funds for the building, the beautiful building we have, which was built in the early 30s. Uh, he also gave a fund for a speaker's program. And I tend to think of the what we call the international program at Cornell as dating to about 1948. Uh, that's when Myron Taylor gave the funds for a speaker's program. That's when Rudy came to Cornell. We had the end of World War II with returning veterans and a great deal more interest in the international world at that particular point, which kind of launched the idea that there ought to be a special program at promoting international and comparative law study. That's what the late Dean Stevens said about the origins. I mean, he, he attributed it to the, the strong demand for an international network of habitually members of service. Exactly, exactly. That was the early uh, period in that uh, end of World War II and uh, 40s, end of the 40s, and then into the 50s. Uh, uh, the uh, special degree, uh, JD with International Legal Studies specialty was created in that time. The graduate program got uh, launched in that period in, in the 50s. The uh, speaker's program was launched in the, in the 50s. Um, if you think about the way the program moved from there, from the 50s to the 60s, uh, there were a number of foundations involved. The James Foundation was important in, in the 50s, and then the Ford Foundation, particularly at the end of the 50s and then into the 60s, with two successive grants to the university as a whole, part of which the law school participated in. Uh, and then after uh, those grants uh, came to an end, there were a number of foundations that had to be uh, pursued for support. That was one of my responsibilities and Bob Anthony's. He and I off were frequently cooperating and trying to see where we'd be able to find financial support uh, for the program, which we were able to do. The Dana Foundation supported us. Uh, the uh, Olin Corporation supported us. Uh, Marie Knoll uh, gave some funds. Uh, I was the Knoll professor from 1986, I think, to 96, somewhere in that period, and I had a number of uh, communications with Marie, and she helped support us in that time. And then came what I always think of, as and I always would describe as sort of the second founding of the international program. If you think of 48 as the first founding, end of World War II, this extra interest in international things. Then think about 1989-90, uh, the end of the Cold War, when communism collapsed. And it looked at that point as if the world was going to be transformed. Now we were going to have uh, every part of the world, including those behind the Iron Curtain, now participating in the global economy. 
that was another boost for international things. And that's when uh, Leo Berger and Arvilla agreed to fund the international program. So it then became the Berger International Legal Studies Program uh, at that point. And then not long after that came the funds from the Arthur Reich uh, estate, really, uh, to support the director of the uh, Berger program. Uh, that came about through uh, the, the activity of Klaus Yonder and uh, Don Shields. It was very unusual. The, Leo Berger was a graduate of the law school, and he used to come back and give talks to the uh, international program, uh, which we, of course, promoted, and, uh, and we were successful in getting his support. Uh, he, he was uh, very successful as, a, as the owner of a, a, a maritime uh, business where he owned American flag vessels and operated them, one of the largest uh, owners of American flag vessels at the time. He'd got to start through, through some Greek uh, vessel owners, and he always complained about the Greeks because they were never, he said, uh, they were never generous with their money. They kept it for themselves. And we were, it was music to our ears, right, that Leo was prepared. And he was extremely generous to the university. And he was proud of that, that he was generous. And uh, as you know, the Berger Atrium is named after him in our villa. And he then gave the funds for the uh, Berger program. I want to tell you a story about that in a minute, but I want to carry on with my theme that we had the second founding because that grant came in 1990, 1992, and that I thought of as the second founding of the international program. It's now called the Berger International Program. But then in 2000 comes Jack Clark, right? And Jack made a number of wonderful gifts to the school, supporting the position that Annalise Riles now holds in the field of East Asian law and culture and a, a grant of a chair, uh, funds for a chair that Mitch Lassa now holds is uh, comparative, the professor of, of uh, comparative legal studies, a chair in women's studies too in the name of his uh, wife, uh, and then funds for the Middle Eastern uh, studies program, which now Chantal Thomas is the uh, director of. So all those funds came in uh, in the early part of the 21st century, uh, which launched the Clark Center for International Legal Studies. So we have a Berger program and we have a Clark Center because of these benefactors' uh, generosity. And to link the beginning of the program with Clark, one of his major interests in the international area was because of Rudy Schlesinger. If you talk to Jack, he would always say what an influence Rudy had on him as a student at the law school, and that was one of the reasons why he was always interested in uh, international affairs. But what I wanted to tell you about the, if I said I had this incident, I wanted to mention about the founding or the renaming and funding of the Berger program. This is a story that uh, Russell Osgood told me because Russell was the dean then, and he and Frank Rhodes uh, were going to propose to uh, Leo that he fund the uh, international program, we would rename it the Berger program. And I remember talking with Russell before they went down to Miami where uh, Leo uh, was domiciled at the time. And Russell reported to me back what the dinner was like. He said, Frank and he went down and they met with Leo and Frank started in only Frank's inimical style of wonderfully uh, gracious way of speaking with his wonderful British accent praising Leo for all the things he had done, how important this was for the university and so on. And of course, Leo appreciated that. He always was very proud of his role. But after Frank had finished, Leo said, how much? <laughs> and so that was Leo, right? He would just get right to the point. And, and he gave us uh, a very important uh, endowment for the international program. Up until that time, we were scrambling always to find funds to continue it. And from that point on, we had this guaranteed fund. And then came the issue of the Paris program. So the Paris program is partly tied to this period of time, too, in the early 90s. Um, because we had the Berger Fund, so we had some support for something bigger in the international area. And uh, at the time, uh, 
Frank was the president, Frank Rhodes, and he, uh, through Russell, said, because I was talking with Russell at the time about Cornell doing something abroad. And, um, I mean, yes. That's right. I taught in the San Diego program. Taught the San Diego program. Exactly. And so it was. You had experience of what this could be for American students and students abroad. That's right. Uh, and, and I also uh, recall, this was another element in this, in this process. Roger, had, Roger was uh, the dean uh, at the time, and he had, uh, Roger Crampton, and he had been uh, a, uh, an inspector for Duke. And he'd come back to law school and talked about how Duke had programs abroad, and that, uh, this was an important part of the Duke uh, activity. And um, up to that point, um, there'd been a little skepticism about these programs. They were, there was a certain sense that maybe they weren't appropriate, maybe they were boondoggles, maybe they weren't serious. Yeah, something like that. But that Duke was doing it uh, made it something that maybe was more respectable than people had thought. And it was all those things that sort of clicked in my mind to say, well, now maybe the law faculty would be open to this idea of something abroad. Now, I'll tell you something more about what my thinking was about it. But uh, prior to it, and this is all happening in the uh, early 90s, the Berger program's been founded, um, I taught for LSU in uh, Aix-en-Provence, that was in the late 80s actually, and then in the uh, early 90s, first uh, San Diego asked me to teach in their Paris program, and I did, and the next year Tulane asked me to teach in their Paris program, and I did, and all this came to a head, and I uh, thought, well, this would be a perfect place for Cornell. Uh, not only Paris, uh, I can elaborate a bit on why that was a logical place, but we also had another kind of ace in the hole, and that was resources, resources which I'm about to talk about too, but about a, person. a person. And the person here was Xavier Blanchuvant. Because Xavier had uh, studied here at Cornell in the graduate program, because of Rudy, in fact, in the 50s. Uh, and Xavier was the comparative law uh, professor at the University of Paris won in the Sorbonne. He even had his office in the Sorbonne. And so when I went to teach with Tulane and with uh, San Diego, I came to know Xavier a little bit better. I knew him here at Cornell because he had been a visitor at Tulane and Pat Sweeney, who was the dean there, a French uh, background uh, dean and professor, he grew up in Grenoble, had called me and said that Xavier wanted to come to Cornell. So I invited him. That's when I first met him, in fact, and he gave a talk here. So I had a prior relationship. And when I got to Paris in these other programs, I got together with Xavier. And when I began to think about Cornell having a program there, the first person I went to was Xavier because of that connection to Cornell. I said, do you think these other programs were not at the Sorbonne? Uh, San Diego was uh, at a special building in the Marais, the 4th arrondissement, and Tulane was in another building near the Saint-Germain-des-Prés. Neither one was at the Sorbonne. So I said, no, that's where Cornell ought to be. And I went to Xavier and said, you think that the Paris One faculty would be willing to let Cornell have a summer program in the Sorbonne? And he said he wasn't sure, but he would bring it up, and uh, so we uh, had a meeting between him and Philippe Manin, who was then the director of the UFR set, which is their international and European law center, and uh, we all got together and talked about the details and agreed, okay, Cornell could have the program there at, at Sorbonne. So that was started in 1994, and it's been a success, and, and we now will be having our 22nd uh, year this coming summer. But here was my thinking about why we should do this uh, in the early 90s. I had a number of thoughts in mind. Uh, one was that uh, we had a graduate program, which in the 48-50 period was very small, right? Seven students, maybe. In 1980, 
we dropped the requirement of a thesis and said uh, the students had to take a writing course, but they could take more coursework instead of thesis work. And it made sense because they were mostly coming with an interest in going back to practice and not into teaching. So why should they spend so much of their credit work in a thesis? So we sort of downgraded the writing, but still maintained a writing component and let them uh, take more coursework. That made it easier because no longer did we have to have a thesis supervisor for every one to start expanding the number of students. And we started in 1980 to continue to expand. Uh, by the 1990s, we maybe had 15 or so LLM students coming in. So we had a flow of students from abroad coming to Cornell, which was very enriching. I thought I was always involved in that and very supportive of that. But it seemed to me that it shouldn't all just be students from abroad coming to Cornell and visiting professors from abroad coming to Cornell. It seemed to me that we ought to have Cornell students going abroad and Cornell faculty doing things abroad. Uh, so that's where the idea of a summer program developed. We would encourage the Cornell students to spend the summer in Paris studying for four weeks. Uh, I wanted a, a location that wasn't English speaking. Uh, so French, a lot of Americans uh, studied French as a second language, so that was a, a very logical place. Paris, the most interesting culturally rich city probably in the world. I think it's probably the primary tourist destination still today. So it was ideal for that point of view. From a comparative law point of view, it's a central uh, player in the world. The two major civil law systems are French and German. Uh, so if you have some sense of how the French legal system works, you have some sense of how the Egyptian legal system works, how systems in Asia work, how East African countries' legal systems work because of the influence of the French. So that was another logical place to go and get exposed in Paris to the French legal system. Encourage students to study French. We have some instruction in French, not for credit, but it's available. So the students, my thought was, would go uh, and the Cornell faculty would go. We would do it differently from what other schools had done. Other schools had only invited visiting professors. A few of their faculty might do it. But we thought this ought to be a Cornell faculty program. And the courses would be in the Cornell curriculum and be Cornell faculty who would teach. But we structured it so that they could also invite a visiting professor to teach a certain number of courses and the professor would, we hoped, come from Europe. That'd be the logical thing. And that would get the Cornell faculty member in touch with European scholars who were equivalent uh, scholars in their field. And that would get them interested in international and comparative activities because of these links. So we built that into the program. And then in the early years, we also had a number of uh, uh, conferences uh, in Paris where we encouraged, again, scholarly development and cooperation. So the idea was uh, Cornell students should go abroad, Cornell faculty should go abroad, Cornell faculty ought to interact with European faculty, and this would enrich everybody and bring uh, comparative uh, and international expertise and, and exposure to Cornell students and Cornell faculty. And it would also build Cornell's reputation for its, for its LLM program, which it also did. So that was the thinking and the origin of the uh, Paris summer program, which is still quite a success and is still functioning more or less with that, those basic parameters uh, now. So you, the division, the right oh. partner, the right partner, and then the resource. The resource, and I forgot to mention, this is where I wanted to mention the anonymous gift that we got, because at that time when I said to Russell this was an idea I wanted to pursue, he said that uh, Frank Rhodes suggested that I write this up as a proposal and he would present it to a possible donor. And we got the news back that yes, we had been given a grant for five years to help this get off the ground because it was going to be expensive at first and might need a while for the number of students to grow to be able to support it. And we got that anonymous uh, grant for that five years plus the Burger Program grant, uh, which uh, was central to this too. Uh, so that was the beginning of another kind of expansion of the international program in the early 90s. And then, as I said, with the uh, Clark program, uh, Jack Clark gifts in the 21st century, beginning of that came another expansion 
uh, of the program and the founding of the Clark Center. Uh, and now, if you think about who we had, when I started right, at Cornell in uh, 1969, the two, the three fundamental people were, were Rudy and Bob Anthony, and then myself, right? And not too long, in 1974 or so, uh, Bob left, uh, first to be the head of the administrative conference, and then he switched to uh, law practice for a while, and then went into teaching in D.C., and then Rudy hit the then mandatory 65 point for retirement. As we all know, he went on to Hastings for another 20 years and taught beautifully there. He's, a, he's famous there too. But that left me. So at that point, I was really the only international person in, in about the middle of the 1970s. Uh, and we had to try to uh, build uh, the faculty. And it, it was a while before that happened, before gaining other faculty members to teach in the international and comparative law field. Now what do we have? Uh, think about comparative law. We have Annalise Riles, who uh, teaches uh, in the Asian legal studies area, uh, head of the Asian uh, East Asian Law and Culture Program. We have Mitchell uh, Lasser, who's comparative law oriented mostly towards Europe. Right, So we've got Asia and Europe now uh, in, in comparative law. In public international law, we have Muna Andula, who's now the Berger, the Reich director of the Berger program, and extremely well known all over the world in his work in the UN and in uh, human rights uh, areas. So we have him, and we have Jens Olin, who does uh, public international law. Uh, in the field of international economic law, uh, we have Chantal Thomas, who does uh, WTO law, uh, trade law. She's also the head of the Middle Eastern Legal Studies Program, right, which brings in visitors in that field. Uh, she's been a dean at, in Egypt, for example, for a number of years. Uh, we have uh, uh, Odette Linau, who does international business transactions. Myself, of course, I'm still teaching in the comparative, in the business law, uh, international business and uh, commercial arbitration uh, area. Uh, and then if you go to human rights, we have Sandra Babcock in the clinic who does human rights, Jutal Kalantri who is involved in uh, human rights activities uh, in a clinical capacity too. Uh, and uh, we have at the administrative level, we have Laura Spitz who's now the director of the uh, international program, the Berger program in the Clark Center and also vice provost at the university level in the international field. And, and several other wonderful staff people, Don Peacock, who's director, executive director of the program, Patricia Hall, who uh, is one of the uh, staff assistants, Amy Hewton, who is now the head of the LLM program, uh, a position that uh, Charlie Crampton did for many years very successfully, and now Amy is, uh, is doing that. So, uh, and I'm probably forgetting some. I tried to write down all the people so I didn't forget anybody. Oh, there's this new uh, assistant professor, Zach Clompton, who's doing international legal studies, and then Barbara Holden-Smith, who did the Sujo program for a time, teaches in the Paris program, and does international litigation. Uh, did I forget anybody? Bob Green in international tax. Right? We have Bob now in international tax. So look at the richness of the faculty and the courses now. And on top of that, you have people who I would say are more domestically focused, but nonetheless, the way everything they are exchanging with colleagues and their work has developed. Just about everyone on the faculty has one of those kinds of dimensions, which therefore makes it difficult to decide who gets to go to Paris to teach every summer, right? Because everybody wants to go and everybody can go uh, because of this dimension. And that was part of what the Paris program was designed for, and it's had that effect. Uh, yeah. In parallel, but also in synergy with the development of legal studies in the world of law. Yeah. 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 Its, its relationship to the programs that you've been responsible for and its effect on the school. Yeah. Uh, as I said, in, it, it's, it had its origins in the 50s, a uh, graduate program. Um, in the. The 80s, so we stripped off the. The thesis requirement to expand. In the 60s, it stayed small. 
Uh, LLM's numbered six to seven every year. A JSD student, maybe once every two years. Very few for that period. In the 80s, 1980 is approximately when we dropped that thesis requirement and were able to expand. And we gradually expanded uh, through the 80s and on up to today, in fact. So today, the number is over 85 of LLM students. And the JSD students in uh, process number something like 15. That's, they're not all here in residence, but in process is something like 15. That's a dramatic change from uh, previous years. So that now they have a real presence in the, in the school and uh, they are uh, always uh, an enrichment uh, for the students so in the classroom. Can they be ignored and say, well, go find your place? Well, that's right. And in fact, if you uh, recall the way we did things in the convocation, when there were six or seven of them, they were the last ones to go across the stage, right? But when they got to be enough of a group to be recognized, they said, well, well wait a minute, our degree is an advanced degree over the uh, first degree. How come we come last? <laughs> so uh, today they go first, right? They sit in the front and they go across the stage first, uh, even though it's a master's and the JD is a doctorate. Uh, we all understand how that came about, uh, but uh, they, uh, they have a speaker now also in, in the convocation. So it, it really enriches the uh, classroom. It has even you know, a broader effect too in the terms of the image for Cornell and the connections for Cornell throughout the world. We have LLMs, people who are LLM students and JSD students who uh, have played uh, very important roles and still do in international affairs. Uh, some that come to mind, uh, Sang Yong Song, who was the president of the criminal court until recently. He was the first president of the International Criminal Court in The Hague, and he did his JSD here at Cornell. In fact, he came to Cornell the same year I did. Uh, he did it in a year. I think John McDonald was the chair of his committee, and I remember David Curtis was on that committee, too, and it seems to me I remember sitting in on some of his defense, too, at that time, so he's an example, uh, but he did the JSD. Uh, let me think of uh, some other examples. Um, yi Wei Chang did her JSD here. Uh, she went on, she's currently back in uh, Shanghai and Beijing, a very prominent uh, lawyer, legal counsel for an important uh, company, ABC, I think it's called, uh, or maybe ABB in uh, China. Recently, I saw her when I was in China in, in uh, 2006. Uh, there's also uh, Juan Carlos Esquerra from Colombia. He did his LLM. I was his advisor when he, was, when he did his LLM in the 70s. Uh, and it was interesting because then I was younger and closer to the students. So one of the things that I used to do was uh, to play games of diplomacy. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but it's a game where you, you actually negotiate with your other players uh, and you move pieces around and you either believe and rely on your negotiated deals or you suspect someone's going to double cross you. But we, these games could go on for a whole weekend, which they used to. And Juan Carlos used to join in these games very enthusiastically, and, and I did too. Uh, and now, years later, who becomes the ambassador from Columbus to the United, well, not the United States, but Juan Carlos Esquerra? So he was the Colombian ambassador to the U.S. later in his career, and then defense minister for Colombia, and now a head of a very prominent uh, law firm. Uh, then there was uh, Jose Taboada. Jose did his JST here. I think Rudy might have been his chair. Uh, he became the head of the Central Bank of Nicaragua during the time when the Sandinistas were uh, in power. But uh, he wasn't particularly political himself. He was head of the Central Bank, which had to function. And uh, he was very successful in that position. And uh, today he's the head of probably the most well-known uh, law firm in Central America, the Taboada Law Firm. Uh, so he was another person from this LLM uh, period. Uh, on the JD side, the person I like to, to point to uh, from the international experience and program is Mike Punk, 
who was a student of mine in trade and who was the editor-in-chief of the uh, International Law Journal when he was uh, at Cornell and who, when he did that, started uh, maybe one of the first uh, annual conferences for the symposium issue of the ILJ, something I pushed the ILJ to do. And his theme then was trade. And then the issue was trade relationship with Japan, because Japan in the 80s was a key factor for us, key competitor in the international, and Japan still very important in trade. But he now is the U.S. ambassador to the WTO in Geneva, so he's negotiating the WTO trade issues uh, for the United States now uh, in Geneva. Uh, and I'm the one who introduced him to international trade law here at Cornell. So the international programs had, but he's not an LLM. He was a JD student. These others were from the LLM and the JSD program. Um, and now we have a very large number of Chinese students coming here because we're so well known now in China. Uh, Cornell as a university was very well known because of the ag school, you probably are aware, since your grandfather was dean of the ag school at one point, if I'm not mistaken, right? And you became the dean here at the law school, which was a wonderful part of our uh, great law school success. Um, and uh, so that background with China was part of the background that has opened up the law school to uh, China as well. I went over there too a bunch of times and most recently, uh, essentially at the invitation, though it came from the university, uh, of Jun Zhao, who was a JD student here, and he now teaches in the Xixiang University in, Shang, in uh, Zhang, let's see, uh, Hangzhou, which is near Shanghai. Uh, he invited, this university invited me, but there was a special endowed lectureship that they invited me for. It was 2006, I believe. And this is what is striking, because it's a vivid memory for me. Uh, my topic was, uh, I had several lectures, but the one that was for the student body as a whole was, um, uh, international commercial and investment arbitration, international commercial investment arbitration. Now, you wouldn't think that would draw too many students, would you? But uh, I was told where the hall would be, and uh, I was escorted by Jun to the lecture hall, and I come into the lecture hall, and there are 500 students out there for this <laughs> lecture hall, the big batter in the back about Professor Barcelo from Cornell, all for uh, international commercial and investment <laughs> arbitration. I said, I can't believe this. I did try to link it to China and the importance of Chinese development, but the uh, president of the university who was in the audience uh, at the beginning of the program uh, said to me, you know, uh, Habermas was one of our visiting lectures too, and he didn't get as many students as you did. <laughs> so I remembered that. That was nice. I thought I, it was a nice comment for him to make to me. I have no idea how June pulled that off to get 500 students in that lecture hall uh, for a talk on arbitration, but he succeeded. Can we talk about UN arbitration? Yeah. Uh, you now have the fifth edition. Sixth. Sixth edition. Sixth just came out. Yes. Sixth came out a month ago. That's right, sixth edition. Uh, wonderful. Of course, both it's used not just in the United States, but three continents. Three. At least three, maybe more, but we know of three Europe, US, and China. We know of those three. It may be used in Australia, too. No. <laughs> no. I don't think it can be found in Antarctica. Now, you and Von Merrick, how did that? Yeah, that's also quite interesting. Actually, the main link in this case book is uh, between me and Tibor Vardy, right? But uh, von Maren was our teacher at Harvard, and uh, it, you, you know some German. Uh, I like to say about Tibor and I that we're Dr. Brüder. Now, that is in German for Dr. Brothers. And the reason why I put it that way is because we had the same Dr. Vater, which is Dr. Father. And in German, your advisor in your doctoral uh, dissertation is known as your Dr. Father. We had the same Dr. Father, who was Hal Berman, not Arthur von Maren, but Hal Berman. I worked with Harold in the international trade field, and Tibor worked with him in the arbitration field. We both did our doctorates uh, at uh, Harvard. 
So we were friends from that period, and we both were students of von Maron, whose major field was comparative law, the probably best known scholar in the US in comparative law uh, at that time. Rudy really was, in a sense, the founder of the comparative law subject in the curriculum of law schools because of his teaching book in comparative law. Uh, but uh, von Maron also did arbitration. And uh, it was, would have to, I'd have to say it was his idea, his inspiration that arbitration should be taught as a comparative law subject, as a uh, world law subject, transnational. transnational subject, and the subject fits perfectly for that. Uh, it is, it's true that it does because there's a certain harmony throughout the world uh, in the field of international arbitration, uh, largely because of the New York Convention. There are now 156 members of the New York Convention. Every important country is a, a member, and the New York Convention functions as a kind of constitution for international arbitration. As Arthur would always say, no single country can control the process. Through this treaty, everyone's agreed that there'll be a process where the arbitration agreement's recognized, the award is recognized, subject to some limited grounds, and you can't get much interference into what the arbitrators do, and then this is enforceable all over the world. So the way to teach it, I like to explain to my students, is a little bit the way we teach tort law in the United States. You know, we say you're teaching in the first year U.S. tort law. Well, there's no U.S. tort law, right? There's the tort law of every individual state, of D.C., of Puerto Rico, of the federal government, of Admiralty, right? They're all those different tort systems. But we teach it in the classroom as if it's U.S. tort law because the principles are essentially the same and we draw ex you know, expertise, we draw examples from uh, different states with decisions and so on that illustrate the issues at stake and maybe a particularly unique way of approaching it. That's exactly what we do with this subject, international commercial arbitration. We draw on cases from all over the world, statutes from all over the world, uh, and we illustrate the issues that are centrally the same throughout the world, but there are variations on every one of these issues that are important to bear in mind. And there are a few leading uh, countries in the arbitration field, as there are leading states in the US, right? So we're teaching tort law, you pay attention to New York law, you pay attention to California law. Uh, same thing happens in this field. And this was particularly appealing to me because I was always interested in comparative law, uh, but this is comparative law with a practical application. This is comparative law functioning in the real world. People deal with these issues with underlying disputing parties who are from different countries. There may be three arbitrators, each one of those in a different country. They might be having the seat in a separate country and the law of some other country might apply. So you have common law lawyers, civil law lawyers sitting together in a panel trying to make a decision. Different types of law might apply, uh, extremely transnational. And so we teach it that way too. We say to students, you really have to understand the subject uh, in that way. So there was where von Maron uh, played an important role I didn't get into the field until about 1990. Tibor always was in the field. That was his major interest, and he's been an arbitrator in many, many occasions. I've been an arbitrator, but not as frequently as uh, Tibor has been. But he proposed to me that we might want to do a teaching book together and that I might want to start teaching arbitration. So I invited him to Cornell, and he taught here as a visiting professor, and I took his course. So that was my first introduction. And then we got together with uh, Arthur and we agreed we would uh, start with some core materials that Arthur had and we would add some materials that Tibor had and I would take responsibility for some chapters and we would build uh, a teaching set of materials which we turned into a published book, which we did. Uh, and then we agreed that if it was successful every three years, we would um, do another edition. So now it's in the sixth edition. We have the book, we have a document supplement, and we have a teacher's manual, which I'm quite proud of because in the teacher's manual, which is almost 600 pages, we answer every question we ask in the book. Uh, now we've just added another author, uh, Stefan Kroll, uh from Germany. He's uh, one of the directors of the uh, VIS International Moot Court Competition that takes place in Vienna and in Hong Kong every year. Now there are more than 200 schools all over the world that participate in this. It's extremely uh, interesting and, and beneficial 
uh, to students, and now Coral is one of our participants. Uh, but now when we work on the uh, teacher's manual, we discover we don't always agree on the answer. <laughs> so <laughs> what we have in the teacher's manual is every now and then we have, but one co-author thinks, <laughs> so two will write and the other co-author will write a kind of dissenting opinion saying you should think about it this way. So this has been very enriching, very stimulating, these communications we're having constantly in this field. You it's, said earlier that, uh, that this now is an area in which you have a lot of uh, focusing. Yes, it, it fits. I mean, what has been essentially my intellectual interest from the beginning, really, and let me mention something about the beginning, which is interesting because it also links to Cornell, and I want to say something else about the links to Cornell. My first exposure to law was through a course in international law, public international law, uh, in which I studied out of Herbert Briggs's book. And Herbert Briggs, of course, was at Cornell in the law school and in the government department here, uh, adjunct in, or, or uh, joint appointment in the law school as well. So that was my first link to uh, law period and international law, which fascinated me from that very early stage. And lo and behold, here I come to Cornell, and there Herbert Briggs is the uh, one of the key figures in public international law. And then Rudy Schlesinger is here, a key figure in comparative law. And Tulane, being in this unique situation of situated in a state where the civil law tradition from France was the legal system there, was always a, a, a school focused on comparative uh, law issues and, and international law issues too, which explains a lot of my interest in the field of international uh, and uh, comparative law. So there was that interesting connection to Cornell even from that early stage. But I was always interested in international cross-cultural things and bringing the world together through practical interactions. I always was more impressed by the idea that we would bring more harmony and peace in the world if we could get people to focus on the kinds of things that every human being is interested in, prosperity, success, uh, chances to give a, lead a good and full life. Uh, and if we had more economic interaction, more cooperation with country, with, with peoples from different countries, that this would promote in the long run peace, but also human prosperity. And so I've been very pro-globalization. So all of the things that interest me have involved uh, ways of uh, focusing on uh, economic interaction with countries in the world, with the legal dim dimension being central to this process of uh, interaction. So international trade always interested me. Uh, legal aspects of it are fascinating. International commercial arbitration, uh, the whole existence of that field comes from the need to have a way of resolving disputes when you have transacting parties who are in different countries and uh, anticipate well, some, of them may even be countries. Uh, some of them may be countries yeah, in the in the investment area of course and even in the commercial area and so they need to have some way of resolving their disputes in a neutral way rather than the other guy's courts and there's where arbitration comes in so it fit perfectly with my fundamental interests WTO law European Union law uh, international commercial arbitration so that's where I have now focused. I'm not teaching 15 other subjects. Those are the subjects I uh, am now teaching. But let me say this. I said I wanted to say something about my links to Cornell. And they go very deep on a personal level. I wasn't a student here. I came in 1969. My wife, Lucy, came a year before me. We met at Cornell. We were married here in Ithaca in Annabelle Taylor. We had our, had our reception on the seventh floor of the tower, the Peace Tower, at the law school. All of our three children were born here in Ithaca. They all went to Cornell as undergraduates. Uh, our oldest daughter said she always wanted to marry a Cornellian. I said, any old generic Cornellian? <laughs> well, she married a Cornellian, who also is an undergraduate at Cornell. She went on to get her PhD at UCLA. Uh, our second daughter did her undergraduate law at Cornell and also graduated from Cornell Law School. And uh, now she's married to another lawyer who, uh, and they've moved and they, they live in, uh, in Sydney now. Uh, our son did his undergraduate work in the engineering school. He did his master's degree at Cornell and 
He married a Cornelia, a Cornell Law School graduate who he met in Paris in connection with the Paris Summer Program. I was there. He was joining in on the activities. We had a tour of the Louvre. Uh, his uh, wife, Carrie, then Carrie Griggs, came along. Uh, I had the opportunity to introduce her to my son. And from that point on, they didn't pay a lot of attention to the art. Uh, and they married, and guess who married him? Me. I was appointed, uh, uh, I think I was called uh, something, Adjunct Commissioner of Marriage Affairs in Alameda County. That wasn't exactly the title, but something like that, which gave me the power to actually marry them. And they asked me to do it. So I was very pleased. Look at all the Cornell connections. So, of course, Cornell has been central. Uh, to our family lives, to my personal life, uh, from from age 28 to current age, as of today, 75. From this uh, very solid and increasingly connected base, uh, you've done a fair amount of teaching overseas. You've also, I think, been quite active in uh, nurturing your multilingual capacity. Uh, can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have taught uh, in a lot of places. Uh, I still teach uh, regularly as a visiting professor at the Central European University in Budapest. Uh, I've done it for more than 20 years now, and that's where my co-author, Tibor Vardy, uh, is a member of the faculty. He's retiring, I think, this year, but uh, it was that link that got me uh, 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 teaching there, they rely in this in that law school uh, heavily on visiting professors. And in fact, our new president Beth Garrett who was actually a visitor at Central uh, European University at one point in her career. I noticed in her resume. So I've done that regularly. Uh, I teach WTO law there for them, and then of course when I'm there, I'm working with Tibor on our book together. So that works uh, very uh, naturally. And of course, the Paris program I teach there, and I've been doing that for. Every year, this will be the 22nd year coming up. I've done that every July. I, forget, I, I, I failed to mention that uh, when Lucy and I were married here in Annabelle Taylor, we chose as our wedding date July 14. Now, that may not mean anything to you, but to every Frenchman, that matters a lot because that's the national holiday in France. And we chose it for that reason. So we're, we've been in Paris celebrating our wedding anniversary with the whole French nation celebrating at the same time. So that's worked out nicely. So I've taught there regularly. I, um, I've taught in Max Bach Institute for a number of years. Joseph Strauss was one of the main links there. Joseph used to teach here occasionally in the field of international intellectual property. And he asked me to join their summer program there and teach a half of a course on arbitration dealing with intellectual property. I'm not an expert in intellectual property, but I taught the part general approach to arbitration. And then an intellectual property expert taught a, a specialized course thereafter in the intellectual property aspects. I taught at Putserius for a number of times. It's, a, it's the more or less, well, it might be one other, but it was the first private law school in Germany, in Hamburg. Uh, Hein Kurtz, who is, was, he's now retired, was a famous comparativist and was the head of the Max Planck Comparative Law Program in Hamburg, also uh, a, a former uh, colleague of Rudy's, uh, was the one who founded that school. And they uh, also wanted uh, visitors to come. And so I was invited to teach there a number of times. And then they cooperated with us in the Sujo program which Barbara was important uh, in. Uh, she was the director of that for the years that it existed. I taught there, too, in the Sujo program in China. Um, I taught in Barcelona, Spain. We had uh, a link with the Pompeo Fabra Law School there, which is where I taught. We still have a cooperative arrangement with Pompeo Fabra and, and also uh, uh, with another law school in, uh, in Spain. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, there's probably some other places that I've taught too, but I have taught all over and I've always been interested in doing it. You meet important colleagues, you get exposed to, I taught in Argentina, uh, in uh, Buenos Aires. We tried to get a program uh, working in 
Buenos Aires. Uh, for two years, I taught there in a program that Ignacio Tortorola, who was a LLM student here at Cornell, and I jointly put together. It was successful, uh, but uh, it hasn't continued. Uh, Ignacio went on. He was then with the foreign ministry in Argentina. He went on to practice in D.C., uh, and it was hard to find a way to uh, get a lot of Cornell students to go. So we had Latin American students, but no Cornell students. I think the school is exploring the possibility of doing more things in Latin America. I know that Laura Spitz has gone to Brazil, and I've always thought, because we had a big presence in Europe, we had a big presence in Asia now, and I said, well, there's Latin America there. We should be doing something uh, there, and I'm expecting that will develop. Uh, but. I, I had some initial uh, exposure in that direction for Cornell and Latin America through the Buenos Aires program. So I have taught all over, and uh, it's been an enrichment for me and been important in my teaching and in my uh, scholarly interests as well. I think we've. Uh, we really have hit on uh, so many of the things that occurred to me when I started thinking about my career and my connections and links uh, to Cornell. I can, I can report something that I always found to be interesting because it also happened to me, and this links to Rudy, because I remember um, this was probably an interview with Rudy that somebody held, and uh, they talked about Rudy's coming here in '48 and how he had stayed until he was 65, and he said, of course, that he had uh, a number of opportunities to go other places. And uh, he and Putty would uh, be troubled by the opportunity and be worried about what decision to make, and they would spend, up, spend the whole night pacing back and forth, back and forth, trying to decide what to do. And then in the early morning, they would see the sun rise over Lake Cayuga, and they would say, we have to stay here in Ithaca. Now, I knew that was an apocryphal story. The sun doesn't rise over Lake Cayuga. The sun sets in Lake Cayuga. And I think that was probably Rudy's signal that, don't take this literally. <laughs> That's how uh, Rudy would have been. So, But Lucy and I did have experiences like that. I had an offer to go... Uh, to uh, her hometown is, is Tempe, Arizona, and her father was on the faculty at ASU. I had an offer to go to ASU. Uh, we paced back and forth uh, all night long trying to decide what to do. Uh, I was actually offered the uh, deanship at ASU on, uh, on occasion, too, and, I, and Tulane offered me a position as well, and I uh, debated about all those positions, and yet every time we thought about it, we just came back to the quality of Cornell, the beauty of Ithaca, the wonderful place to raise a family, but particularly the, the quality of, of Cornell as a university, not just the law school, but the law school has always been, to my mind, a jewel of a school. Uh, and we just uh, didn't see uh, any way to leave. And so we've stayed for now, my 47th year. And if I teach another year, which I'm supposed to do, that I think I'm the longest serving faculty member on in Cornell's history. Faust was up, up when well, he retired, and I'm, I'm in the, that. well, no, I'm about to match Faust in the 47th year. If I go on another uh, year, I will go beyond that, but, but Kevin's coming behind me, and he promises to be the longest serving, so he may go on even longer than, than I here at the, at the school. You know, I, I do, I, there's something else just to comment about, about the change in the school, too. This is also interesting because uh, I remember very distinctly when I started uh, at the law school, it was virtually all male. Right? All the students were male. There may have been three uh, women in the class, and all almost uh, uh, white. There were very few minority students. Uh, and that's been a tremendous change, right, in, in this period of time, uh, where now uh, the faculty is more evenly divided with uh, women and men, and the uh, female-male ratio almost is 50-50, and the number of minority students that we have is 40% uh, or some very large number. So a dramatic change uh, in that period of time 
in that uh, dimension of the school, which is a terrific change. Uh, and even the, the style of teaching, I think, has changed somewhat. From those early years, it was a harsh Socratic teaching method that was admired and even promoted among the faculty. And I always were like that. Exactly, exactly. And they encouraged that type of teaching style. But what I think changed that, Peter, was the presence of women in the classroom. As women grew in the classroom, it became much more difficult for male teachers to treat the female students in the way they treated male students. And the female students wouldn't tolerate it in the way that male students would. Male students would feel this is part of the process. I have to get toughened up for this, but the female students wouldn't tolerate being insulted. So both of those factors, we still use a Socratic method. It just isn't that kind of harsh uh, Socratic teaching style. The only people who can do that now are the female law teachers. And some of them are known to be pretty demanding teachers in the classroom. So that's another interesting change over the, that period of time. As we end, I want to say happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.